Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny Podcast. This is your host, Stephen Spector. With me, as usual, is Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, good afternoon, Rob. Hello, Stephen. And uh, today oh, is you, quite you something. You hear a little, a little sadness in my voice from podcast recordings lost. Yeah, we, we tried a new tool this morning. Rob and I did a whole hour-long podcast that appears to have disappeared into the, um, the digital unknown. So uh, we had a momentary uh, depression, but uh, we will come back to speed because we have our first return guest, Rob. This is really Ooh, exciting. Awesome. We've, you know, we've hit, well, by the time this goes out, we will have probably been around 56, 57 podcasts. So we've passed a year and we thought, uh, you know, we do need to bring back some really great guests to kind of get where they're at. And we brought back uh, Yves Bordreau from Ericsson. And his title, which I like, VP of Partnerships and Ecosystem Strategy. And uh, he does a lot of work on Ericsson's UDN Edge um, platform. So we're kind of calling the follow up and see where we're at. Yves, welcome to the uh, podcast. Hi, guys. I'm, I'm sorry for your loss. Um, uh, I think that uh, you're still on track to be a, a five nines podcast, which in, uh, in the world of telecom is still, is still a good number. <laughs> the, the the fun thing is that this will there's a time zone there's a time machine element to this because uh one of the topics for that podcast that you can now influence is uh the state of the the state of the edge report yes uh, which was the the lost podcast um was and and we'll redo it is the is that is our is our analysis of that so now you can sort of nudge the judges oh it's like the lost nirvana recordings if anybody could find them it would be worth millions right <laughs> well i don't know you know they found a bunch of lost recordings from uh prince and i'm not sure that music should ever be released i think maybe not i think we won't like it so <laughs> maybe things get lost for a reason rob Mm. Maybe there's, there's there's diamonds there's di there's diamonds there we'll re we'll reconsider. So, use let's start you know your you partic Erickson participated in the State of the Edge report which is is quite detailed and and even though we're not going to go the whole thing with you we do you know can you give us a little insight into um, Erickson's participation what what you were looking to achieve with this with this Edge report. At this point, if you go to, uh, what is it, stateoftheedge.com, you can actually download the report itself and read it. But ultimately, it was a very interesting conversation with the guys over at Packet back in January saying, you know, listen, I, we're, there's so much fragmentation in terms of just language being used. And, and frankly, a lot of this was driven by, you know, me starting to listen to your podcast as well as I saw kind of all the stuff that was out there. We were actually going to do something like this on our own. And then we realized that, okay, this is going to be yet another uh, paper, right? So looking at myself in the mirror here saying, do we really want to just add more noise and fuel to the fire and confuse people? Or could we actually find some like-minded individuals and frankly, the CNCF on top of all of that and some other industry folks who also are just as, I would say frustrated necessarily versus, okay, let's do something just a little bit different to go and try and uh, amalgamate as much as we know between at least more than just one company and then publish it in such a way that we can start an iterative, let's say, process of capturing our thoughts and getting very specific about how people are going to use the edge, not in 20 years from now or even five years from now, but how are people doing it today and what problems are they solving? So the hope is that this becomes, uh, I wouldn't say a catch-all, but a collaborative version of publications uh, with some speaking engagements and stuff that we would support as an organization that's open to anybody to participate, to try and, and bring some reality to the situation here, right? If I, if I see one more, and this is one criticism that I, I have of, of the report, at least the first one, right, is we, we lead off with um, my two most infamously despised cases of autonomous driving and virtual reality, which by the way, I'm not opposed to. I think they're great. I just don't think they're around the corner, uh, pun intended, like people think that they are. Um, and there's much more pressing issues that we could solve and so one of the reasons why I listen to your podcast is because people do bring real use cases to the table of here's how I would use it today, or, or here is why some of these cases that are brought up uh, are not there. So we, uh, we funded uh, partially the report with the other sponsors. Uh, we participated in, in some of the contributions. We did let the, the writers you know, do, do most of the writing. We edited some things and added some stuff to the glossary, the landscape map, the interviews that were done by the analysts that, that took care of the report. And we we're quite happy with, uh, with the outcome, but there's still a lot of work to do. And I'm, I'm hoping that you guys would come back and, and give us some, some harsh criticisms that we can go and address. And so that we're, we're all kept honest as a community, but it's open to anybody and happy to start getting some feedback from people on what, what's in it. 
you know, when we looked at it, we thought, you know, the care, the thought were clearly there. The funny thing about any of these industry components is, right, they're, they're vendored. They have a vendor perspective. Mm. Um, and I think our job is, you know, we talk to, <laughs> we talk to people who are vendors, we are vendors, is to be objective and, and sort of help filter, filter on that side. Yeah. I do want to drill in. So there's, there's this interesting thing, because you're right, autonomous cars are sort of this obvious need. They're a good reference example. It is. It's sort of a false. It's not something that you're going to get individual developers or small companies building, doing, using, being part of. It's, it's a pretty closed ecosystem. Are there more accessible edge environments for you? Accessible in, in, in kind of what sense? Right. We've had all these applications where you don't need an autonomous car as a platform. You don't need distributed edge infrastructure. You can just sort of get it going. Is there, is there use cases that you think are going to be more accessible for people? Well, I can tell you what uh, my conclusion was after, let's say, nine months here. What you'll see kind of in some of our, I'll call it collateral, but essentially it's what we say out there is, you know, the first wave of applications that we think are, are early starters really are in, I'll call it the acceleration space, if you will. But it's, it's basically with technology companies that if they can touch packets sooner in the transmission chain, um, that they can actually do something meaningful with them. So giving them edge compute resources uh, closer to where the users are, the, the eyeballs on the eyeball network side of things actually affords them the opportunity to add whatever secret sauce or special uh, things they want from a software standpoint sooner in the process, which overall seems to be better for anybody. And this is one of the things that sort of comes up in the report peripherally, but what you're describing is edge as an accelerant, not edge as the, you know, I, I can't start until edge is here. Yeah. In this case, it's actually edge as a platform where acceleration technology uh, can live to actually, you know, perform, let's say the benefits that it claims to. Whereas if it was much more centrally located or that those packets were touched much later in the process, the value of the technology itself is greatly diminished or actually doesn't exist at all. And I'll give you a couple of cases today okay. as well. Ironically, I came back from uh, Bulgaria this week, which I'd never been to uh, before. It was uh, somebody asked me how, how that was. And I said it was Bulgaria's, but nobody seems to get my humor. There was two, two takeaways for, for me out of Bulgaria that had nothing to do with technology. One is everybody still smokes everywhere, which I thought was interesting, even in the taxi cabs. But the second thing was that uh, you're apparently supposed to use a lot of profane language in all of the panel sessions. And as soon as you start using a little bit of profanity, people shut down their, their laptops and, and get off of their phones. So you may hear some, uh, some engagement tactics from me on this call. So we'll, we'll stay tuned. I love it. Get the fuck out, man. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. It's crazy talk. It's crazy talk. So we'll see how many people. Uh, <laughs> I was told I would get a nice uh, bottle of Canadian whiskey for every uh, uh, every superlative I used going forward. So let, let's see. Let's see how good we get. But um, <laughs> one of the companies that we're working with that we started. I'm lighting talking, up a cigarette right now. So yeah. <laughs> we're full Bulgaria on on this podcast. Uh, hail Bulgaria! Happy Bulgaria! One of the companies that we've been working extensively with in the kind of the the acceleration space is a company called Haste. Haste is actually uh, a startup here in Atlanta. They focus on some uh, very interesting uh, acceleration technology that's applied to the gaming space. Ironically enough, you can go to their, their website and, and, and look at what they do specifically. Uh, but what they have from a technology standpoint, today we host in our core locations, which are, is more traditional, I would say, of, of a public centralized public cloud. So a little more in the metropolitan uh, city area or, or specifically where everybody else is interconnecting. And, and the technology does okay in those environments. What they basically uh, do is they create some multi-path and accelerated path uh, pipes on top of uh, traditional routing in order to do kind of like a, a best path first kind of a network that essentially will reduce the, the lag the overall kind of round trip times on all the control traffic for, for PC gaming. They're working with us with some of the service providers at the moment to go and essentially, you know, address an issue, which my son berates me on a regular basis about, about how his games are, are lagging and it's all the internet's fault. And in a way he's, he's just being a, you know, an 11 year old. In another way he's, he's completely right that there are things that we can do that we're just not doing as an industry. But one of those things that haste is very specific specifically interested in is the fact that the closer that we can get to those eyeballs and apply our technology inside the operator's network, the more lag we can reduce and the better experience we can provide. What we see is a lot of these smaller technology companies that if they had 10 years to launch a global network to do this, they would do that. 
they don't have 10 years anymore. They, they may have 12 to 24 months to go and validate not only if the technology works, but if there's a market for it. So now what we're trying to do with our Edge platform is give the opportunity for these companies that feel that their technology would just run better in, in, in conjunction with a service provider's network inside that they, they approach us and they, they tell us why that is. And in a lot of cases, we've turned away dozens of companies and we say, listen, you're fine with public cloud. There is no, right. there is no benefit here from a technology standpoint to go and do this. So, so don't do it, which ironically enough is uh, some people like it and other people say, well, you know, can't we just give you money? And it's like, prefer, we prefer not to. Uh, it's just I, well, not, it's not core to the edge. So what you're what you're describing here is opportunity cost around edge, right? And we had, we had Jason Hoffman on a little while ago. He, we were talking about sort of the killer app and you know what it, what's going to drive it. For you, there's there's this opportunity cost. I'm going to push back a little bit because there's an opportunity cost to say these are natural applications. They fit our our model. We should go after them. Could you be missing the killer app by saying the opportunity cost of chasing a, a bad fit use case is too high? I think you can. I think you can also look at it as a graduated approach. More often than not, we actually say, yes, that's a great idea. And then people, you know, and we give people tools to, to have them understand if something is, is worth doing or not. And those tools are really just questions to ask. You know, if you're not running in public cloud today, chances are that you're not going to actually entrust an edge cloud provider. You, you have security issues or you have data localization policies that you need to, to fit or something just needs to be under lock and key of the enterprise that, that's doing it. So you're not a really good candidate if you haven't made that cultural shift to, to public cloud and public internet traffic. Uh, luckily for us, and I think I mentioned this in the last, pod, last podcast as well, and it's kind of been amplified in all of our discussions, is, is that everybody gets that they're going to do something like this. They, they have mm -hmm. to connect into the public cloud ecosystem because that's where all the applications are now, or at least a lot of the emerging applications, the Ubers, Lyfts, uh, Netflix, they're all out there. You have to interconnect with them at least from that standpoint. You may not want to run your stuff there, but you're going to have to figure out a way to connect into them. But there's an interesting piece of what you're saying because right public cloud is the dominant de delivery platform today and it there's cloud native was a big sponsor in the report and and you've made some some nods to cloud native uh, i want to dig into a little bit more soon but does that mean that you know edge infrastructure it's not cloud we're not we, we don't even need to have that conversation but the development paradigm is cloud how do you how do you break that apart i definitely would agree with you that it's not centralized public cloud I think that it is still cloud from a lot of other different aspects in terms of a lot of the technologies that are used that are also used in cloud. I think it's also true of the fact that because a lot of these networks on the edge that people are building are accessible by the public internet, that it sort of kind of makes it cloud from that standpoint. I, I do get frustrated with you know some discussions with people that don't get specific, right? So when I talk about cloud or IoT, what part of the ecosystem is somebody really trying to, to, to play in, right? And there are a lot of subcategories there, but then there's the sub subcategories. That's when you can get very specific to the applications and then decide whether or not this is the next big thing or not, right? If I said, hey, I mean, what, what do you guys do? You know, go to a dinner party and people are like, what do you do? Uh, I'm in transportation. Okay. What does that tell you? Does it mean you're an Uber driver? Uh, does it mean you're a fleet manager for UPS? Does it mean that you sell used cars? I mean, it doesn't give anybody any useful information. So either you don't know what it is that, that your business is about or what you're trying to address, or you don't want to tell me. In either scenario, it's a bad situation, in my opinion. Travel is the same situation. I want to do stuff in travel. Okay, does that mean you Airbnb your home? Or does that mean you're, uh, you own a hotel? Does it mean you build airplanes? Like, well, what does that really mean? So my hope is that for, for future discussions that everybody comes on is they're going to get very specific, at least give us one use case, uh, something that people can get their heads around of how we're going to use uh, this edge network, if you want to call it that. Because cloud without network is, not, is nothing, right? I mean, you have to have connectivity into the thing. You have to be able to get stuff in and out uh, in an affordable way. Some things right. simply just will not scale in public cloud for various reasons, uh, predominantly on the fact that the network for centralized cloud is not as uh, large and as uh, diverse and as um, accessible to end consumers as an operator network is. Um, but I want people, my call to action for people is to stop being so fucking generic about everything and just say something specific that people can get their head around that's not 10 years out. This is something I, I do like to push people on to, be, to get into a little bit more depth off the hook i do want to dig in on that but but i keep having all we have this conversations with you so i have a lot of placeholders which is good i want to decompose a little bit because cloud considered elastic and and when people talk about not having bounded you know resources cloud is the place that people think to that's the purpose and yet you're describing cloud as bounded from the network side 
Mm -hmm. And so is edge solving that problem? It's going to have, you know, much less computational elasticity, but much less network elasticity. Is that a, a definitional helpful? I think this notion that cloud is elastic is only as good as how, how, how far and how long you'll pull the, the elasticity uh, to what there is. So it's not like it's a, yeah, it's not an unlimited, it's not a limitless resource that if, you know, let's say for example, uh, throw a number out there, right? And I don't have any, any real research to prove that this is what it is, right? I'm sure Gartner and IDC do, but if I was to go look at the amount of IT spend that there is in private data centers versus public cloud, right? Public cloud is, I think the last account I saw was an $11 billion a quarter business. And that's the entire, you know, stack from, from start to finish. So it's a $50 billion business. If I look at global IT, it's a trillion dollar business. How many applications are run in private data centers versus public cloud? I mean, you'd be lucky if you could find 5%, okay, of those applications, let's say by revenue spent, revenue generated, or even infrastructure installed. It's not out there yet. So if I all of a sudden flip the switch, just like if I did with video, for example, and I said, all of the pay TV uh, that's delivered today over private networks, all of a sudden was turned on or put onto the internet, right? Well, the internet's elastic too. Does the internet just keep going, growing and everything just magically adjusts itself? Of course it doesn't. The game that's being played, and, and, and rightfully so, is the elasticity needs to scale with the amount of traffic and applications that will move from private networks onto public ones. And that's happening, right? Both on the internet generically and in cloud as well. But when I say that an application uh, from an edge standpoint doesn't have a chance to scale without the edge, right? There's another compute partner of ours. Their name is uh, NetInsight. And NetInsight builds a, a, a piece of compartmentalized software that essentially reduces all of the latency out of uh, over-the-top video. So if you and I are watching, mm. uh, for example, the World Cup on our, on our tablets for some reason in a bar together, typically, and the, and the bar is also playing the World, same World Cup game uh, on the screen or a different one. The one that you see on the screen typically in the, the big screen that comes from satellite or from cable is typically fairly far ahead in terms of um, the broadcast. So it's typically anywhere between 30 and, a, and 90 seconds uh, faster than what you'll get on a device. So this company, for example, uh, removes all of that latency, right? They'll say six to six, wow. six seconds of glass to glass latency and claim to be faster than broadcast. Um, they can also synchronize it with the local broadcast. But the idea is that that technology, if rolled out, okay, let's say it's just a, a five megabit feed. If you're doing 10,000 of those, okay, you can do the math. It's, it's gigabits per second. Okay. Now, if I was to say go to 100,000 and start adding zeros, right? If I say a million users are going to watch the World Cup in a particular location, there's no public cloud in the world that has enough egress out there from a, from a sheer capacity standpoint. And even if they did, what they're going to charge you is significantly greater from a pricing standpoint uh, because they just haven't rolled out enough capacity to get those, those economies of scale. The only way that this technology can see the light of day okay, is if it's actually rolled out in partnership with service providers in some way, shape, or form, which is what we're trying to do on the UDN side is create this environment to make something scalable at the edge of the network. Right? So if I look at uh, what would yeah. be your estimate then, Rob, of how much bandwidth a public cloud actually has out there it's probably measured in, in, in it's, let's it's say, 100. It's huge, it's huge in, in relative terms, but it's yeah. tiny in terms that you're describing, especially egress. Uh, ingress is, is going to be more even limited. Worse. Uh, yeah, even worse on the ingress side. So, uh, yeah. you know, if I was to measure the best public clouds, right, separately or in aggregate as, as hundreds of gigabits networks, and I was to say that in one particular country, I look at, let's say, Comcast or AT&T or even Vodafone. If you look at the amount of mobile and fixed line capacity that they have, it's measured in the terabits and exabits of traffic, right? right? So if I have applications specifically on the video side that I want to scale, I couldn't even if I wanted to do it in centralized public cloud, so, both from a technology so you, and from a, from a commercial standpoint. You, you are hitting uh, one, of, one of, I think, our, our, new, our new games of edge whack-a-mole, which, <laughs> which I like. Because what you're describing is a financial incentive for edge that is different than people think from a normal model. So there's an element here where things are showing up that aren't edge specialized. Your, your example here is not an edge, what people would think of as an edge application. Yep. It's a mobile phone app or it's a video streaming thing. And you're saying, if we don't fix the edge and create edge infrastructure and platforms and things like that that people can leverage, Amazon is going to not be able to, you know, we're going to have a financial hit from people, everybody consuming Amazon, because everybody's going to be hurt when, when we run out of egress elasticity at Amazon. Yeah. We have to a financial motivation to solve this problem that is not 
the direct two parties involved, but a broader, you know, so Amazon could show up and say, I know it's going to hurt my business, but I'm going to fix this. I'm going to help fix this edge problem because if I don't, the thing I'm making a lot more money on is going to, is, is going to be hurt. Is that a fair Sort of. It is a fair statement. And the way that I, I, I kind of couch this with people is that, and, and we're, in, we're in real kind of debt, I guess, to the, uh, to the large public cloud providers because they are creating market and, and a need for, for other things like, like Edge Cloud, which doesn't really exist today. But at the end of it all, what are they doing? They're taking more applications, more egress, they're building their networks, and they're just pushing them closer to the Edge networks. And the opportunity for service providers is before they completely lose control of kind of one of the last big pieces of, of strategic geography and infrastructure that they have is to build out something before it's, it's kind of too late. <laughs> I, I, you're saying that and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking they're pretty close to too late. Yeah. They need to need to figure this out super quickly. And it's yeah. a, it's a development problem. It's not, I'm going to build servers or I need to know how, obviously we think provisioning servers and running IT infrastructure is really important to making this go. However, it's going to be one on these applica- you know, application delivery mm-hmm. uh, components. Yeah, no, I think we, we, the web scale guys have done a really good job at providing a centralized environment for people to innovate. Now it's up right. to the service providers to, to band together. And we think that we're helping them do that with UDN, but to band together in order to scale those innovations. So to me, it's not an either or, but if you give a web scale player enough time and enough money and they continue to gain control, I mean, they're, if you look at any analyst report on how much they're spending on infrastructure, connectivity, fiber networks, it's, it's billions and billions of dollars. And that will continue, which I think so is a good you, thing overall for consumers. Gonna lose, are they, I mean, they're, they're incredible innovators, but this is the classic innovators dilemma because the, the things that are going to have to be done for edge are disruptive to the patterns and practice that they should just go dump all of their innovation budget on. Mm-hmm. Right. Amazon, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, are chasing each other. They're going to, they should be innovating against beating each other to the, you know, there is no finish line. So making the best big centralized public cloud, hyperscale, adjective, adjective, adjective thing out there, you know, for them to chase edge in some ways is disruptive. Uh, maybe Google would do it because they're in the, they're, they're in the, they're in the dust position at this point. Or are you saying that this is the telcos have a chance to, to take, you know, to sort of maybe leapfrog? I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it's a leapfrog moment, more so than a a chess move and getting there before you know that that spot is taken. I don't know that there's an opportunity to leapfrog per se, but uh, I could be wrong, and I'd love to be wrong in this particular case. But I think from a defensive strategy standpoint, uh, the service provider guys um, have been largely focused on growing very successful businesses and and doing innovation work on the side. Uh, and now we're hoping that they'll continue right. to entrust you know, the UDN team here to help them at least get to that, that, uh, that next chess move and then see what we can do from there and what applications arise that, that get enabled by that. But I do, I do have a question for you in that case, Rob, right? You've done, yeah, please. And, and this is a, maybe a, a call for people who are listening to this one, this podcast for the first time or haven't caught up on the, on the rest of the, the 50 plus episodes that you guys have done. But, and, and Stephen can chime in too. Do you guys have like a favorite, you know, one or two use cases that you guys feel are legitimate uses of the infrastructure edge, I guess, is how, how it's being defined, uh, not only in, in your podcasts, but also in the state of the edge report. What are, what are your kind of like top high runners of, of edge applications that people can get around that are, that are specific that you guys have learned about? Podcast we did, which should be out by, I think the time we listened to this was from uh, Hangar. And you had and to pick the one I didn't listen to yet, so I'll take my own advice well, and go listen to that one. I don't now. think it's out yet. It's not out yet. <laughs> so we, we, uh, we're we ahead of the game, but but the hangar, what I really liked is, so, so for our audience, it's, you know, drones. It, it's doing um, robot drones. They're automated and they run scripts, and it's fascinating. But the thing that I really thought was interesting about what hangar was saying is the the processing and all the data collection, it all doesn't have to come just from the drone. The drone can leverage signals coming from a variety of sources Mm. to then figure out what to do based on those sources. So when I think of that and I look at the car example, which you all hate, everyone now is trying to put everything in the car. So the car does everything. It has all this stuff. And the idea that, well, maybe it doesn't need to. I know we've had another podcast where someone said, why don't you have the intersections tell the car what to do as it drives through the intersection. And so the car responds to information it's given, even though 
instead of trying to make the decision itself. And Hanger had that kind of different interpretation. And I thought that was fascinating and it made great sense. The example they gave is if there's, if it's flying and there's airplanes coming or weather is coming in, it can listen to weather reports. And if a signal coming from a weather sensor says the winds are going to get too high right now, it will automatically bring itself down. And that's not something that it is actively doing. It's just getting sensor data from other sources and making a decision. Right. That to me was really quite something that you can leverage this variety of data to make choices. It's, it's worth as a caveat for that. I think yeah. that that's the vision. The reality is much more, they don't have that infrastructure built yet. So it's, you, know, you, you bring some servers to the site and then the drones are run by the servers on the site. There's, there's, mm -hmm. we're not, we're not at the aggregated data, especially the multi-vendor data. You know, for me, I'll give you sort of two answers because there's a huge problem to solve of having all of the things that are in our environments already sharing data that I think is a, is a really significant problem to solve and solving that is will unlock a lot of innovation because then I can be in space or in, in my, my personal space and then do the thing that I think is more immediate, which is real is augmented reality. The, the opportunity from an augmented reality view to one, create amazing overlay experiences for people, but then incorporate data from non-siloed, all this non-siloed data. I should look around my room, and if I have a, a thermo, smart thermostat, I should have data from my smart thermostat overlaid into my view, whether I need it or not. I mean, so I, I think AR is, is potentially the killer app, mm -hmm. and it doesn't require you to have it goggles and glass and all the AR accoutrements yet. I think we actually can create meaningful, valuable AR experiences on with people's phones and, and phone cameras. When I look at what something that doesn't require new innovation, but has immediate value, phone-based AR is actually very accessible. Um, and I think it will, will has the potential to be that initial driving app. Right, that's one of the things to me, that would be the concrete. I'd love to see somebody who's really doing that. And they don't necessarily consider that an edge application. It's an edge accelerated app. You know, I, I do think with, with cars, they're useful just from the, they're very tangible. And the one thing that, that edge and cars, we don't talk about much, but I love is using edge infrastructure, to look around corners for cars. And we don't, we, we, all our autonomous vehicle stuff right now is, um, in car, in car, in car, in car. And it's just yes. not a, it's not really what the end state I think is gonna look like. Cause nobody wants to put a hundred thousand dollars worth of compute in a car and burn the batteries down. The idea of networking the cars together, which is a significant social problem, yeah. not a um, political problem, it's not a tech problem. Yep. Those two things and the drones hook together for one more item and then I'll stop being long-winded, which is batteries. So the insight that we had with Jason Hoffman, uh, people should go listen to that podcast. Uh, it'll drop before this one. Batteries are potentially the killer app. If you, if you say, all right, I need to improve battery life on my AR goggles. This was Jason's example or my drone, the hangar example, um, or my car. <laughs> Offloading compute from that is, is saving money. It's, it's, imp you know, it's reducing the cost to that device. I think that, if you want to look around for the ultimate edge applications, find ones where batteries are the limiting factor and invest there. That's definitely a good segue because you're right. You know, we, we believe there's something in automotive as well. Uh, not only because, you know, I work for a company that sells a lot of mobile infrastructure, but these devices, you know, some people call them data center on wheels, which I think is a little cliche. Uh, if you talk to any or most, I would say, of the, uh, the car manufacturers, nobody wants to build a more expensive car <laughs> necessarily. In exactly. fact, the culture there is to build something more efficiently and less. But you do see models that do have a lot of things that they would not normally have on board. Uh, ironically, the data that's there or the capability of, uh, of the data capture that's there uh, is either thrown away or processed directly on the vehicle. And so I think what people need to, to remember is, yes, that's true today, but I agree with you. Once they figure out what their killer app is going to be or killer apps or the data that they need or the insights that they'll generate or the, or frankly, the commercial arrangements that they'll put together, 
I think you do get to the cost reduction piece and then the cost reduction then gets centralized and shared uh, in the cloud. Whether or not it's shared or cost reduced or scaled centrally or, or in a distributed fashion at the edge of the network really is going to be a function of how popular this gets and what the, what the parameters of the workloads are. In the very early days on, on the, um, with the automotive industry, we get feedback that there's need for them to do some of their functions or perform some of their functions or store some of their data in a specific country or postal code or zip code. Mm-hmm. You know, the data sovereignty, data localization thing, I, I didn't actually know was going to be as let's say, popular of a discussion topic, but that can change overnight. As soon as somebody says, ah, you know what, I don't have to have my data in Australia. It's okay if I bring it to the U.S. And my data or my application is not latency sensitive. So it, it, it could ebb and flow based on a policy change or frankly, some IT guy retiring and a new person coming in saying, this is a little bit ridiculous. Why are we doing this? If I'm going to bet on data sovereignty going away, I, that, I will short that. I think we're moving into a world where data sovereignty is going to be more of a concern. I agree. I completely agree. Not less. Um, I completely agree. The, the, other, the other point that I would add to what you said, uh, I think it's really important. Look at cost per MIP for a processor in an edge device or a processor in a car or drone or something like that. It's much, much higher than a off-the-shelf CPU that I could put in an edge data center. The ability and end, firmware is easier to manage, right? The more I offload from that, it's not about, you know, we don't have to be technicians to, to, to say it's a, it's a cost issue. If, if I can take, you know, complexity and code and processing that I have to pay per penny, per, you know, on a, on a MIPS basis and move it into cheaper, you know, locations, even if that cheaper location is at a, you know, data center, uh, phone point of presence, then uh, central office, oh my goodness, I could save in aggregate of buying processors or you know, millions and millions of dollars and, and buy that data center infrastructure many times over. I mean, this yeah. is part of the whole argument for cloud. Uh, I don't think is entirely true, but Amazon's cost per MIP is cheaper than anybody else's on the planet, except maybe Google. Pass that savings on to the consumer necessarily, but it is a factor in, in their infrastructure. I agree with you. And one of the things that I did appreciate from um, uh, Simon uh, Crosby uh, of Swim AI in his, uh, and since they're doing edge stuff, was the, the actual commercial comparison, right, of the intersection and the costs of actually using centralized cloud in the, in the intersection example for the city of Palo Alto. I don't know if that was a real example or not, but it was definitely, you know, used as an example that would illustrate kind of his, his point there. And that was in a previous podcast. So I won't, I won't repeat what he said necessarily, but it was an example that people could put numbers to that hopefully could get their head around uh, edge intelligence using their technology and how something really needed to be ha- to happen closer just based on the economics of, of GPUs. Right. So you're talking about MIPS. He was, he didn't use the, uh, the word, you know, G flop in this case, but some of these things, I don't think we're going to need some, some big thinkers like these guys to come back and say, look a little bit around the corner, right. When we're talking millions of sensors, think of tens of billions of sensors coming in. There's a great application with uh, around affinity and geo resolution that right now in a lot of these IoT environments for for Sigfox and LoRaWAN uh, work just fine in a centralized environment, right? But they're only talking about hundreds of thousands of sensors right now. And they all know that if this thing takes off, uh, they have to distribute some of these geo resolution functions at the the edge of the network. Not only because the network itself won't scale. Uh, to handle all the traffic, right? In terms of the sheer, uh, it, w- it wouldn't be from a bandwidth standpoint, it would be just from a small object standpoint, just the data- databases that they have and how they choose to store that data and then re-access it. People don't realize, I, don't, I, I think that if they haven't built a network or worked in network technology or you know, inside of a computer, every time a piece of data touches a piece of hardware in a network on a motherboard, off motherboard is adding latency. Now, if you multiply, you know, uh, you know, look at a web page and how many calls it makes these days to all these different ad servers and cookie servers, and it, it's ridiculous, right? You know, when I talk to people and they say, oh, there's, yeah, my application has an API call. It has an API call. Okay. I don't think you understand, but there's probably thousands, right, of API calls and chatty traffic. And every one of those transactions touches a piece of hardware and adds microseconds that add up to milliseconds that add up to seconds of latency. Wherever you can shave off uh, touch points in the network or simplify these chatty protocols and, and reduce the amount of processing and storage that happens. That's where the real benefits uh, of latency are going to happen. And you're going to see things that were not possible before because it takes too long 
hopefully evolve into these next gen, you know, big kind of um, applications that are now seen as the next big thing. So I want to take something you said and, and segue into what's going to have to be our, our final topic as, as much as Stephen as I, I go. I'm watching. <laughs> the, let's talk about free software. And I say that with air quotes. Nothing um, is free, Rob. Nothing is every, free. Yeah. It, no, no, no. Yeah. Everybody has told me it's not open source software. It's free software, right? Mm. Totally sarcastic. <laughs> you know, one of the things in the, in the, the edge report and I think it's interesting to hear your opinions on is the impact and potential for uh, community development, open shared open source collaboration, software that that's not proprietary, you know, so, so less, you know, maybe maybe less barrier, less cost barrier to entry. We should put the free stuff to the side because that's a whole whole podcast. Yep. Um, but I, I do want to know, you know, what's the software side of it? How are we building? You know, commu- you know, software in, com- in communities, how we're solving this problem collaboratively. Let's see what happens in a post get owned by Microsoft world, I guess, and what the impact will be there. Uh, I'm hopeful that this is a really a new Microsoft anyway, but um, we'll see if the rest of the development community uh, agrees uh, over time. You know, you guys have talked about this in podcasts. I don't think my, my personal opinion probably doesn't necessarily gel with, uh, with Ericsson's. Um, when these, uh, I forget which, which podcast you were talking about, but somebody was comparing OpenStack to Kubernetes. And uh, there was a list, I think, that you had started kind of um, – uh, talking about with your guest at the time, um, and his name escapes me, but about the the you know what are the what are the right ingredients for open source projects? The one I do remember is that if something you know is vendor, and I would agree with this statement that if something was largely vendor driven, became something that wasn't adopted early by a large community before they kind of went commercial, that that was part of the recipe for something that would not survive, well, at least not survive. Was it? Yeah, so, so, so. not. Uh, that would not necessarily survive or at least grow to the level that, you know, the hopes and dreams were. The other thing that you had mentioned, I think, uh, and maybe this was in a different podcast, but um, altogether, but one of those other ingredients was the fact that if you, if you became too broadly scoped uh, too soon, or frankly, just too broadly scoped in general, that uh, when you try and boil the ocean with some of these projects, that um, uh, it becomes kind of another recipe for for disaster. And then the third one that I, I've seen multiple times is that the original drivers, the individuals who are drivers on the projects, uh, exit and go do something different and, and essentially yeah. orphan these things. But they all they all translate to the same thing, that if you do not have enough folks that are, are really into the project for the long term who are going to drive this thing for at least, I would say, in, in this environment, three to five years, it may have been 10 in the past, you know, the original original Linux guys are still out there, right? And they're still driving and still speaking. And I think it speaks to not only the adoption of Linux as an operating system, but you have to have some longevity from a, a sponsorship standpoint and not just sponsorship of people talking about it, but still people contributing and leading by example. And I think that's where a lot of these open source projects fall short. I don't, I don't know that there's a secret recipe that but I think it would make it for a great book and maybe somebody's already written one on what it takes to to be successful in open source but the road is littered with companies who started with free right take my software and uh, they just can't make the conversion to um, to paid so I think you guys probably have more experience than, than most and certainly more experience than me and, and what those recipes are but I think it would be great to find somebody who's been successful in that space and give people kind of a uh, a very quick kind of view of the world of here's what it takes to be successful in open source. You can't just say, I use open source, therefore it'll, it'll survive. It's a lot of work. It's a, it's a lot this of work. Is, more, than, a, more than what most people a, are willing to put in. It's a, this is a good place to hat tip to Jenova Bacon, uh, who's written some art of the community pieces and, and thought about that. He almost, he's the name that came to mind when you were saying, is somebody wrote okay. yeah. about how to make this. You know, I, I look at like the Kubernetes community, pretty clear to me right now that Kubernetes will be a foundational piece for building edge infrastructure, in part because it's exactly what you described earlier. It's cloud software that, it's, that we can use in solving edge problems. So I, I heard the same thing about OpenStack yeah. f- uh, four years ago. That's because I did a good job. <laughs> Eves, that's, that's because I did such a good job convincing <laughs> everyone with the first release that the damn thing was ready to go. Yep. Blame me. There, there's so much marketing hype, but the difference is Kubernetes seems to be being used a lot more you know people out there talking about i use the solutions i use this piece oh it was more of openstack telling everyone what we were going to be it wasn't Mm -hmm. users and i think Mm -hmm. that's a difference yeah yeah and i think it it falls apart with some of the things that uh that i mentioned earlier in terms of being vendor driven not necessarily having the support and growing too fast in areas that probably shouldn't have grown in but the biggest argument that i hear about kubernetes and and we, we do use kubernetes today 
uh, and we're finding out the strengths and weaknesses of it is because Google's behind it primarily and because the CNCF, uh, you know, there's an organization and people that are contributing is, is why it's going to be successful. And I would say that a lot of the things that you, you know, you claim now that uh, would, will make Kubernetes successful are exactly what I've heard from multiple open source projects. Now, I'm not doubting that Kubernetes will be used and successful, but I mean, let's not, let's not forget that when you're talking about large established organizations that have a history of open source projects like Apache um, and, and they go out and they open source things. There's just, there's just so many projects that don't make it as ones that do. So the, the answer is not to not try, but when I look at Kubernetes and I see what it's good for versus what it's not good for, I think people just dust over the not good over part saying, oh, that'll get solved by the community. And I'm not convinced that it will in all of these That's cases. Right. Or something um, new. And, and for Edge, just if, I, sorry, Steve. Go ahead. I was just going to say something new will come along when I think about everything was Docker and Docker was going to own the world. What was that two years ago? Yeah. The, the acceleration going from own the world to disappear is fast. And so we never know what's going to get built next. Yeah. No, you never know what's going to get built next and you never know what will be successful. What's true is that what people learn and what they're comfortable with, if you can get enough of a community around that contributing, using uh, and feeding back that have less commercial interests as opposed to larger ones, then there, there's definitely, you know, an indicator that that, that creates some longevity, uh, but it's not a guarantee. Ironically enough, uh, somebody should go out there and do a, maybe a study of uh, scraping some job websites to see, you know, what people are looking for in terms of capabilities. Still huge, believe it or not. Yeah, Oracle it is. is still huge, and uh, well, like I still use GIMP. I mean, you know, that's pretty old piece <laughs> of open source software still around. So your your definition of what see what is I don't know. It sounds like a great master's or PhD study for a uh, student. Yeah. Well, hey, Rob, to, to, will you let me go back to school I, and get a PhD, and I'll do I'll all do this on behalf of rack end. <laughs> <laughs> podcast uh, sure of course <laughs> but but yes. to, your, to your points though on on what's popular right is it, you can go look at you know the stack overflow developer survey that they do every year if you don't if you don't know what that one is go have a look at it from a listener's uh, standpoint it, it actually shows you what these people are doing and using right and to me that's the that's the bellwether or you know the canary in the coal mine with respect to if you're looking at what's trending over years what has a shot at really standing out? Um, and then there's the Git developer survey as well that, that kind of shows these things. If you can get a pulse on enough of these larger development communities, what they want to learn, what they're using, but that trended over time, I think you'll get a much, much better in indication of which open source projects you could map to the languages that are being used, the databases that are being used, the applications that are scaling, and really kind of make a better projection based on data on if this thing has legs and what you know how long the legs are gonna be uh, from a development standpoint. Well but I'm going to, I'm going to push back on, on a couple of things. And then, then we do need to start wrapping up because I mean, and Erickson's a great example because of Erlang, right? Where Erlang is tiny. It, it's smaller than tiny and yet it's used to solve. Well, it's huge to us, right? And I know you're a fan, so it's huge problems. to you. So that's great. I'm a big fan, but, but <laughs> people don't realize what Erlang is embedded in and operates for and how it, you know, what, what how much innovation goes on on top of that platform. And so yeah. I don't think you have to have a big team with bright flashy lights to solve, you know, really good problem, you know, just to, to, to be innovative and, and impact in the, these environments. Along those lines, one of the problems and differences between OpenStack and Kubernetes that people overlook is that OpenStack is an infrastructure platform, super hard, very edgy. They tried to take on use cases that made the platform very complex mm -hmm. and Kubernetes is not. Kubernetes is a, is a service management platform. Yes. Doesn't really care about infrastructure. And so the problem space that it's solving is much bigger. And so I, I you know, I, I'll challenge you on the, you know, I, I agree about the hype cycles and things like that, but I think OpenStack tried to solve an infrastructure problem without realizing they were an infrastructure problem mm -hmm. and got thought they were became, becoming a developer platform. Yep. Kubernetes to me hasn't walked that line. Kubernetes knows it's a developer platform, stays there, doesn't try to solve the infrastructure problems, hasn't had to at least.
Yeah. Um, well, one of the yeah. So shame on me for coming in here with generic uh, hand waving, uh, and thanks yeah. for calling calling me out on it. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. Uh, no, I'm I'm teasing. Well, when I there's this great Wikipedia YouTube video that shows how they use Kubernetes. They are very transparent with some of the uh, shortcomings, if you will. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I really enjoy some of those chats when, you know, people who aren't going to use the platform or, or are not really going to follow, you know, what, what it's used for, to your point on the, on the orchestration and management, as opposed to the networking side of things, there are people trying to make it a networking platform. Now, how they're doing this, I have no idea, right? Yeah. And why they would do this, I have no idea. But to your point of elasticity uh, earlier, right, this is like the, the poster child for, you know, if you want to be elastic, you should be using you know, the baseline premise of everything that is Kubernetes. Oh, by the way, because it came from a company that only uses it for themselves, um, you know, we're going to have to solve these multi-tenant issues. And now you've got companies that are being built around solving a multi-tenant issue or Red Hat saying, hey, the, the non-free version of this, by the way, we've already solved some of these problems. So we'll, we'll see where, where some of these kind of come up. But I was really surprised by the version of Kubernetes you know, not supporting uh, IP version six that Wikipedia was using, for example, right? Now, of course, that'll get solved over time. But, you know, to, to, to say I'm hitching my bandwagon to Kubernetes and that's all I'm going to do is, it can be, to me, is it, I have to shake my head because I don't fully understand why people are, are so excited other than it's just the flavor of the month and, and just because so you know, out of that stack cool thing. It, it is, yeah. but uh, Erlang is now making this big new uh, resurgence, right? Um, thanks to Rob's <laughs> efforts and uh, all the... <laughs> but in, in, that stack, in that Stack Overflow survey uh, for, the, for, for this year, it's still in like yeah. the top 20 languages that people you know, love. I don't see a lot of that. And that's an example, I think, of longevity. But um, it, it takes a very special developer to get into something like an Erlang versus a Python that can be picked up with a few... Uh, a yeah. few classes at your local university. Yeah, so. but, the, but, the, but the reality is, and this to me is true with Edge. Uh, Stephen, I know you want to take us out, so I'll make the point fast. Edge is going to be a very infrastructure and it's suit to purpose. So the idea that some of this, you know, the is Edge problems are going to be solved in generic ways by, you know, just rubbing, you know, rubbing OpenStack or Kubernetes on it is, is naive. Or, you know, Erlang is going to, you know, the Erlang example is a good one. It's going to bypass the, you know, the right fit platform and tooling. It should bypass, you know, force fitting the round peg into the square hole. That, that to me is a good takeaway for, for the conversation in a lot of ways. So, so yeah. I'll, I'll close it out, Yves, and, and I'll just, just to poke fun at, you didn't write the whole guide, but just to poke fun, I'll end it with the <laughs> state of the edge thing, that there's a section about development there, since we're talking about languages and stuff, that mm -hmm. says porting your cloud application to the edge is a no-brainer, and it's very easy. That was my highlight of the. Uh, <laughs> I uh, I will ship you a copy of my uh, <laughs> physically highlighted version, and I would agree. Um, I think we we've already been asked to do a section on what portability of applications means. Yeah. And you know what I say about everything that I do, Stephen? I said if you like it, it was all me. If you don't like it, it was somebody else. Well, of course, it was someone else. Well, Yves and Rob, thanks again. Uh, <laughs> a, another great discussion, and uh, we appreciate uh, all the work you've done, Yves, to help promote the podcast. And as I tell you, you are still the number one most listened podcast, which is why I brought you back, of course. We will see if this podcast beats that one. For all our listeners, it is important that Yves stay number one. So uh, <laughs> if, if you decide that, you know what, I'm tired of Yves, you can go listen to some other podcasts a little bit. Uh, I am keeping track, but uh, it, it's good fun. And we appreciate of Erickson, you know, really coming and providing their thoughts and, and their leadership. Well, thank you to uh, both of you. And we'll talk again soon.